Welcome again to an episode of Learn the TOEFL the easy way with Teacher Fish. Before we start our lesson, please adjust the resolution on the settings for better video quality. For today's lesson, we will talk about another TOEFL listening question type called Connecting Content. Be sure to watch the video in full because I will be giving some tips to make answering a connecting content question easier. Connecting content question almost exclusively appears after a lecture. It measures the test taker's ability to understand how ideas in the lecture are related with one another. How ideas are related may either be clearly stated, or inferred from the words of the professor. Almost all connecting content questions concern major relationships in the passage. These questions also commonly appear when the passage discusses a number of themes, ideas, people, or objects. Connecting content question has two formats. The first format appears as chart or table. It will then have four sentences or phrases, and you have to match them with a theme, idea, cause, effect, object, or individual. It may appear on the test like this. Which type of X do the following sentences refer to? Other connecting content questions ask you to make inferences based on the relationships that are mentioned in the passage. These questions may appear on the test like these. What is the likely outcome of doing procedure X before procedure Y? What can be inferred about X? What does the professor imply about X? What comparison does the professor make between X and Y? So, it is again time to learn about the strategies in answering a connecting content question. Pay attention because the next things that I will talk about will surely make answering a connecting content question easier. The first is to note the steps or procedures that the speaker mentions. As you note take of these details, be also sure that you understand the correct order. As what we've previously discussed, a connecting content question usually appears as chart or table, or may need you to put phrases or even sentences in proper order. By being able to take notes of the details and the order as the professor mentions them in his lecture, you'd have a higher chance of correctly answering the question. Here is a sample lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. There are countless tiny organisms in the world. Some of them are dangerous to other living things. We call them pathogens. There are four main pathogens. They are bacteria, fungi, viruses, and prions. All of them can be harmful to living organisms. Some, however, can be, um, be helpful. This is true of many types of bacteria. But for the most part, these microorganisms are killers. Throughout history, they've killed untold millions of people. They do this by spreading through living organisms. This makes them very difficult to destroy. The first, bacteria are found everywhere. They're even inside our bodies. But the human body has many defenses against them. As a result, bacteria are less harmful than other pathogens. However, some bacteria, such as those that cause tuberculosis and pneumonia, are killers. Bacteria can also cause food to spoil, so I suppose they harm humans indirectly as well. As for fungi, despite killing plants, they're not too harmful to people. They mostly cause minor problems for humans. Viruses, on the other hand, are deadlier. They cause diseases such as smallpox, polio, and influenza. Malaria, a deadly virus, kills more than one million people every year. Finally, what about prions? They're rare, yet deadly. Prions cause diseases that attack the brain and nervous system. Mad cow disease is caused by prions. The human form of this disease is rare, but it's always fatal. Now that you know a little about each type of pathogen, let's go into detail on them. First, bacteria. In the sample lecture, the professor first introduced the four types of pathogens, then focused on bacteria. She gave details about what bacteria can do, like making food spoil. The professor also talked about them being less harmful than other pathogens. In addition, 
She describes some bacteria as killers, those that can cause tuberculosis and pneumonia. As with viruses, the professor mentioned several diseases caused by viruses, including malaria and polio. So again, by being able to take notes of these details, you have a higher chance of answering the question correctly. The second strategy is to pay attention to the relationships between facts, concepts, or ideas that are mentioned in the passage. Try to understand if the professor is mentioning similarities or differences between the various points he or she makes in the lecture, and try to recognize how he or she is doing so. In addition, it would make listening for the relationships more effective if you also pay attention to terminologies that are repeated multiple times in the passage and the details about them each time they are mentioned, because who knows, the question might ask you to put statements in categories. Here is a sample. Terephylum is a small genus of freshwater fish known to most aquarists as angelfish. There are quite a number of angelfish species that belong to this genus, but today, we will focus on the two most sought-after ones. The Terephylum altums and Terephylum leopoldi. First, the Terephylum altum is characterized by a silvery base color and dark black or brownish stripes in its body. Likewise, the Terephylum leopoldi has silvery base color and dark stripes in its body. Next, almost exclusively collected in the waters of Rio Atabapo and Orinoco and the breeding conditions required, the altums are quite rare in the aquarium hobby. In the same manner, leopoldi is also hard to find in the hobby these days, probably due to its population in the wild, or that the species require a special type of care. Notice that the professor mentioned the term, Terephylum altums and Terephylum leopoldi several times in the lecture, then followed by descriptions about them. These are very good indicators that the professor is trying to tell us about the similarities between the two angelfish species. Likewise, the third strategy is to be able to determine whether the professor is making a comparison, recognizing cause and effect, following a sequence, or identifying a contrast. You may be asked to figure out these relationships. As you may already know, speakers' word choice or expressions are very helpful in determining relationships. So, let us again have some sample expressions that a speaker may use. When the professor intends to show similarities or make comparisons in his lecture, he or she may use expressions like, in the same manner, also, similarly, likewise. As for recognizing cause and effect relationship, the professor may say, therefore, so, thus, or consequently. A lecture that follows a sequence may contain words such as, then, next, after, and later. Finally, if the lecture indicates a contrast relationship, it may include expressions as, in contrast, on the other hand, in spite of, and yet. To see what I am talking about, let us again have our sample part of a lecture. Terephylum is a small genus of freshwater fish known to most aquarists as angelfish. There are quite a number of angelfish species that belong to this genus, but today, we will focus on the two most sought-after ones. The Terephylum altums and Terephylum leopoldi. First, the Terephylum altum is characterized by a silvery base color and dark black or brownish stripes in its body. Likewise, the Terephylum leopoldi has silvery base color and dark stripes in its body. Next, almost exclusively collected in the waters of Rio Atabapo and Orinoco and the breeding conditions required, the altums are quite rare in the aquarium hobby. In the same manner, leopoldi is also hard to find in the hobby these days, probably due to its population in the wild, or that the species require a special type of care. Notice that the professor uses the expressions, likewise, and in the same manner, to indicate a comparison relationship. So for the last strategy, try to infer as much information as possible, based from the relationships that are mentioned in the passage. Focus not only on the relationship and information given about them, but also to the possible outcome of future actions. Who knows, the question may require you to predict an outcome, 
draw a conclusion, extrapolate some additional information, or infer a cause-effect relationship. So it is always wise to be prepared for these situations. Now, in doing this, rely on the notes you have on paper. Use your own words when you sum up the ideas you wrote on paper. That way, it would be easier for you to come up with a more logical reasoning. Furthermore, before choosing an answer, make use of the process of elimination. Cross out the answer choices that do not match the idea or reasoning that you came up with. Remember the four strategies that you have to incorporate every time you answer one of the most difficult listening question, connecting content. Again they are. Note the steps or procedures that the speaker mentions. Then, pay attention to the relationships between facts, concepts, or ideas. Next, determine what the professor is trying to make. Is he trying to show comparison, a cause-effect relationship, following a sequence, or making a comparison? Finally, try to infer as much information as possible. Try to master these strategies and I guarantee that this difficult listening question type will become easier to solve. And so, it is again time for us to check your understanding of the strategies in solving for connecting content question, and see how you'd use your newly learned skills into practice. Listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. The second biggest species of penguins is the king penguin. The largest, of course, is the emperor penguin. We'll get to that animal next. Anyway, king penguins live and breed on the numerous small islands in the South Atlantic Ocean, north of Antarctica. In autumn, they come ashore and form massive colonies. Then they prepare to breed. The first stage of the breeding process is called molting. Basically, the penguins shed their excess feathers and grow a new set. Until this happens, they can't swim well or hunt for food. Once their new feathers grow, the penguins can begin their search for a mate. Both male and female king penguins try to attract their mates. They do this by uh, performing. For instance, they raise their heads, puff out their chests, and call out to attract mates. Then they begin the selection process. Each penguin stays with his or her mate throughout the mating season but penguins may change mates from season to season. The female lays one egg per season. Both parents take turns protecting it, and later, the newborn chick. While one is off feeding and hunting, the other stays to guard against predators. Oh, and king penguins are unlike many other penguins in one way. They don't build nests of rocks or other things. Instead, they use their bodies to protect their eggs and chicks from the weather and they breed in the summer months. Remember that they live in the southern hemisphere, so December is summer down there. This improves the survival chances of their chicks. King penguins don't all breed at the same time. Early breeders pick mates in September and lay their eggs in November, but late breeders pick their mates in November and lay their eggs in January. Early breeders' chicks have better chances of surviving, Often, when a late breeding pair loses a chick, the penguins become early breeders the next year. Format 1 Based on the information in the lecture, indicate which statements refer to king penguins' behavior during or after the mating season. Format 2 What can be inferred about king penguins that are molting? Now let us check your answers for format 1. Choices 1 and 3 are actions that king penguins do during the mating season. They both describe ways of attracting mates. On the other hand, choices 2 and 4 are actions that king penguins do after the mating season. As mentioned in the lecture, king penguins do not keep the same mates every year. Also, after their offspring is born, they stand guard and look for predators in order to protect their babies. As with format 2, choice C is the correct answer. What the professor says about molting is that, basically, the penguins shed their excess feathers and grow a new set. 
Until this happens, they cannot swim well or hunt for food. It can then be inferred that penguins do not spend much time in the water while molting. Choice A is incorrect because penguins find their mates after they molt. Choice B is also incorrect because the professor does not mention anything about penguins dying or getting hurt. Choice D is wrong because penguins, according to the professor, do not have chicks while they are molting. And so, we have reached the end of our lesson video about another TOEFL listening question type, connecting content question. I hope that after watching the video, you now find the question easier to answer. If you have comments, suggestions, and feedback, please leave them on the comment section, and I will do my best to answer them as fast as I can. Also, please do not forget to press like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell, so that you'd be informed every time I upload a new video. And always remember, the TOEFL is not difficult, if you know what to do. With that, see you again on the next episode of, Learn the TOEFL the easy way with, Teacher Fish.